Hi everybody, welcome back to Lafayette Systems. I make rockets with active control systems like this one that has a flight computer in its nose and four movable aft control surfaces that steer it through the air. I have a number of different size rockets with different control layouts and guidance schemes and even a hot launch silo. Three, two, one. This video is about an important part of these rockets as systems, the radio data link. Now I have a whole build series on this rocket, Diamond X. Video 1 focused on its airframe and construction, and the second video is all about avionics. The third video is a deep dive into the flight computer and flight software. This video is a supplement to those, but this data link is used for all the rockets that I fly. Now this video is going to get a bit technical at times, talking about bits and bytes and payloads and checksums, but I'll try to keep it as approachable as I can. So what is a data link and why do we need one? A data link like this actually has a pretty simple job. Let elements on this rocket network talk to each other seamlessly. I need to be able to push a button on the ground control software, and the rocket has to do something. We're going to break down this structure into a number of different layers to make it easier to understand what's going on. For those of you with a computer science background, the seven layer OSI model should look really familiar. Now my network is actually much simpler. It uses a static hub and spoke geometry, and we don't need to negotiate permissions or anything. So that lets us simplify the model a whole bunch down to just the three layers shown here. First, we're going to talk about what these layers do, and then dive into each one and see how it works. So first is the interface layer. This translates a user input on my ground control software into a command, and then when the rocket receives that command, it does something with it. This is implemented on the ground control software and on the flight software. Next is what I'm going to call the transport protocol layer. This takes all the information we're sending back and forth and puts them into concise little packets. It also performs error checking, so when we receive a packet, we know that we've received it in its entirety and there's no errors in the message. This uses a protocol that I made up that I call scalpel. And lastly is the physical layer. This is how we get those packets from one place to another. This is either a wired connection using something like USB or RS-422, or it is a wireless connection using an XB radio. So first let's look at the interface layer. This is basically like a rocket language. Uh, you can't just scream at a rocket uh, in English and have it do something, so we need to invent a language that the rocket can speak and then make sure that your ground control software is speaking that same language to your rocket. Now the cool thing is that you can just make this language up. It can be whatever you want. Now the language my rockets speak is called AVC, or All Vehicle Communications. In practice, this is a really big Word document that lists what all the commands are and then what all of the payload structures are so I can make sure those are standardized across all the different systems on the network. If I want the rocket to do something, like test its fins for example, I send it a command from the ground station. So in the Word document, I list what all these commands are and then I assigned each one of them a different number. In the case of a fin test, that number is 101 decimal. If the rocket receives command 101, it executes a series of processing functions which end with its control state being changed to control fin test. Then I have to make sure that when I push the appropriate button on the GCS, it sends the command 101 over the radio. As long as I don't mix up anything in that process, the whole thing works out. For your rockets, you can make up your own commands. You can have your commands be as many bits long or short as you want, and you can even do multi-byte commands if you're interested. Now that all sounds pretty easy, but in practice the data link gets a whole lot more complicated. First, if I have multiple rockets or other things like launch silos out at the range, I don't want all of them to start executing whatever they think command 101 does. We need to be able to send a command to an individual device on the network. We also need to tell the rocket to interpret 101 as a command, not something else like a network ping or as telemetry. So AVC sentences, what we call the payload, always start with two special bytes at the very front that avoid these mix-ups. The first byte sent in every AVC payload specifies who is sending and who should be receiving the following information. When the other network's devices receive and parse a packet, they check the receiver ID. If the receiver isn't them, then they can safely ignore the rest of the message. These take the form of 4-bit addresses set in the compiled flight code, so I can have up to 16 different devices on the network. Byte 2 is a payload descriptor byte, and describes how the receiver should interpret the rest of the message. If I want to send commands, for example, I make sure that this byte is decimal 20. When the rocket receives that, it parses everything that follows as commands. There are a number of other types of payloads which we'll send, and we'll discuss these later in the video, and they'll each get their own payload descriptor byte. Now, for a lot of reasons, sometimes commands don't quite make it to the rocket, especially if the physical layer relies on a radio connection. Because of this, AVC also features a command acknowledgement function. When the ground station sends a command, it's also added to a big list of unacknowledged commands along with the time that it was sent. When the rocket receives a list of commands, they're echoed back to the sender as command acknowledgements. 
When the ground station receives these back, it removes them from the unacknowledged commands list. If a command sits on that list for too long, it's resent over and over and over again until it either times out or the rocket finally receives it. This whole process helps us make certain that when we send a command, the rocket receives it and I don't have to sit there mashing the fin test button until something finally happens. So far, we've only looked at half of the data link's functionality though. Sending the rocket commands is great, but the rocket also needs to be sending down telemetry telling me what state it's in, position, velocity, all sorts of stuff. So let's switch gears and look at the second half of AVC, which is the telemetry functionality. The rocket is sensing and recording a lot of different channels of data, and it needs to send some of that data down to the ground station for display on the screen. This generally takes the form of the rocket sending long lists of numbers, which we need to parse correctly on the ground. We need to know if a number is a voltage, a speed, what format it's in, whether it's an integer or a floating point number, and what to do with that number once we finally get it. There's also too much data to reliably send a single massive list, so we break up the data into shorter telemetry payloads and send them one chunk at a time. For telemetry, AVC specifies a number of different telemetry structures. All have a maximum length of 28 bytes, and we'll get to this limit later. For Diamond X, there are six different telemetry payloads it sends down. It sends these one at a time, and when we get to telemetry structure six, we loop back and start with number one again. Each telemetry has a different payload descriptor byte which lets the ground control software figure out what to do with any given string of numbers that it receives. AVC then specifies what each byte in each different payload means. Both the rocket flight code and GCS parsing code have to agree on the structure, again where that Word document comes in handy. And like the commands list, this structure is something you get to make up for your rockets. You get to decide what data to send and what its precision is. Now I've got another video coming out on this channel very shortly, and when it does I'll link it in the description. That is a worked example of both AVC generating a telemetry payload, and then also the scalpel process by which we put that into a packet. It gets pretty technical, so I've put that in a separate video, but if you want to make your own data link system, I'm hoping that's a good resource to help. So there's our first layer. That's all vehicle communications, and it does the telemetry and the commanding for the rocket. Again, this is the rocket language that all the devices on this network speak. So wrapped around these AVC payloads is something that I'll call the transport protocol layer. This is four extra bytes, and this extra information is responsible for ensuring that the payload is delivered in full without any errors to the receiver. Now remember, these payloads might be sent asynchronously, with one byte coming in at a time, and they also might have variable message length. We saw this in the commands. Commands might be sent, you know, one command at a time, but the payloads for telemetry might be up to 28 bytes long. So the receiver has to know when one packet ends and when the next packet begins, particularly if it's just receiving a stream of uninterrupted bytes. So the protocol that I came up with for this is called the Scalpel, or the Systems Communications Asynchronous Protocol Lightweight. Because remember, if you ever want to work for the military industrial complex, your most important skill is actually making acronyms. And I'm putting those skills to the test a whole bunch in this video. So first, we got to tell when one Scalpel packet stops and the next one starts. So to do this, we pick a very special byte you get to pick. I picked decimal 170. This is AA in hexadecimal, or in binary, it's 10101010. We're going to put this start byte right at the beginning of every single packet that we send. So when we're processing this data stream, if we ever see decimal 170 as a byte, we know that a new packet has started and we process it as such. Now next up is message length. Because we have these variable message links, we need to include a payload length byte. This tells us how long the incoming packet is and when we should stop. With the second byte, we can include the length of the payload, and this will inform our processing function when to stop parsing this and when to start looking for the beginning of the next packet. In between them, there might be noise or something, so we want to separate the stop processing one packet and the start processing the next one function. Now we're going to pause here and jump back to the start byte discussion. We chose the byte decimal 170 to indicate when a new packet has begun, but some of you may have already noticed a problem. If we're scanning that start byte to show up to start reading the next packet, what happens when one of our payload bytes happens to be that start byte? Right? Maybe we're sending 170 millivolts as an integer, and so that byte would just be 170. If that happens, then this whole protocol breaks down, and we start reading one packet halfway through the previous one, the world collapses. So one method to solve this is called consistent overhead byte stuffing, or COBS. This is probably the most complicated part of the protocol, so if it doesn't make sense on your first viewing, that's totally okay. I had to read a whole bunch of stuff on it to make it make sense. There's plenty of resources out there that are going to describe it better than me, and I'll link some of those in the video description. So Cobb solves the problem of our start byte showing up anywhere in the payload by just removing it if that ever happens, and very cleverly replacing it with something else. The short version of this is that this Cobb's byte, byte number three, 
contains the index of the next byte, which happens to be the start byte. We're then safe to replace that byte in the payload with something else. Because we might have 170 appear multiple times, a logical thing to replace this byte with is the index of the next time it happens, and then replace that one with the index of the next time it happens. If the start byte doesn't appear anywhere else in the payload, then we can either replace this last one with the index of itself, or the index of something that's longer than the length of the payload. When you actually go to process a packet, first we start at the COBS byte, and we go to the byte to which it's indexing, replacing that with 170 again. This gets our completed payload to the destination without ever having to send that start byte anywhere inside of the payload itself. Now the last feature we have to look at is error checking. We just have one extra byte at the end of the packet, and this is going to be a checksum. There's a whole bunch of different ways to checksum. Checksumming basically involves taking the payload and then running it through a mathematical function and recording its output. We then take the payload we receive, run it through that same mathematical function, and then our two checksums should match. If the checksums don't match, then that indicates that there is an error somewhere either in our payload or in the checksum itself. There are similar systems that actually do error correction, so they'll tell you not just that there's an error, but where the error is, and then it actually allows you to correct the packet. I haven't implemented that, but that's a great next step if you're trying to do a more sophisticated data link. Now, order here is important. This checksum can evaluate to any value between 0 and 255, including 170, which is our start byte. For that reason, the payload and the checksum need to be included in the COBS process. Because the checksum excludes our COBS and packet length bytes, errors in either of those two won't get caught. Scalpel actually includes a method for detecting errors in those two bytes, but I'll go into detail on that in the worked example video. It's a little too technical for this one. So that's our transport protocol layer. It gets the payload prepared into packets, which can be sent asynchronously and with variable message length. With a 28-byte payload and 32-byte total packet, we are at best 87.5% efficient at sending data, and if we're only sending a single command, it's not very efficient, but that's okay. Now, I'm not going to claim that the system is perfect or optimal. It does work, but I'm sure some of you guys have seen areas where it can be improved, and I encourage you to include some of those improvements in any of your data links. So the last layer is our physical layer. We have to get these scalpel packets from the sender to the receiver. It was important for me that this data link protocol work with different physical layers. Our primary physical layer is the XB Pro 900 HP radio. This is a 900 megahertz radio link, and I might switch this to the RFD 900 soon, but they both function very similarly. But importantly, this data could be sent over any physical medium. I mean, your rocket could even have a huge speaker and then just scream bytes to the microphone on your laptop if you really wanted to. Now, I don't recommend this. But in theory, everything would function the same way, because the upper layers don't actually care what the lower layer does to get the information from point A to point B as long as it gets there. Now, when these packets are sent over something like an XB or an RFD 900, they aren't really asynchronous. The XB does its own extra error detection, and probably correction, and it also packetizes everything into discrete packets, so this whole scalpel process is probably unnecessary. If you aren't going to rely on multiple different physical layers, and you're just going to do a radio, you can probably nix the entire transport protocol layer. So that's it. That's the whole data link. We've gone through all three layers and talked about what each one does. I'm hoping this video is a useful resource for you guys when you're making your own projects. And please let me know if you've come up with any better systems that I might implement in future iterations of this link. So we've got more cool rocket launches coming up, and I'm also working on a modeling and simulation video as the next iteration in the Diamond X build series. So thanks everybody for hanging out, and I'll see you in the next one.